Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Matt Ewalt, the Senior Director of Events and Live Journalism for the Texas Tribune. Welcome to those joining us here in person in Houston and those joining us online for our program titled Texas and the Race to Provide the World's Clean Energy. Texas is known around, across the world as a top energy producer primarily because of the state's massive oil and gas industry. But as we continue to face the impacts of climate change, some in the state are pushing for Texas to be a national leader in the clean energy movement as well. Hydrogen initiatives are drawing interest, so is geothermal power. Companies large and small are working to figure out the next best thing when it comes to energy. Will these efforts help to secure Texas's future as an energy and economic leader? Today's program is for all Texans interested in the topic, whether you're an industry expert or simply curious about the future of what may power our communities. And we'll begin the program with a quick overview of the technology itself before our con conversation continues. We are joined this afternoon by Robert Bullard, Executive Director of the Bullard Center for Environmental and Climate Justice at Texas Southern University. Sarah Jewett, Vice President of Strategy at Fervo Energy, and Brett Perlman, CEO of the Center for Houston's Future. The program is moderated by my colleague, Emily Foxhall, climate reporter for the Tribune. Our program will run a little over an hour with 50, uh, 55 minutes or so for conversation, especially since we talk a little about the technology itself, and then 15 minutes or so for your questions. Here in Houston, we have mics for our in-person audience, and our virtual audience can also submit questions online at our Q&A portal, texastribune.org ask. We are grateful for the support of our sponsors. Our major sponsor for today's event is Ally Energy. Our foundation sponsors are the Energy Foundation and the Cynthia and George Mitchell Foundation. Though corporate sponsors and donors underwrite this event, they play no role in determining the content, speakers, or line of questioning. And on behalf of my Tribune colleagues, I also want to thank all of those throughout the state of Texas who support the impactful journalism of the Tribune including those who have become members. To learn more and to become a member, visit texastribune.org slash support. And finally, we want to thank the folks at EDP Renewables for hosting us today. We have a number of upcoming Tribune events around the state, including one on art and democracy in Texas, being held April 10th in El Paso and online as part of our We the Texans project focused on democracy in Texas. That's followed by a full day symposium in El Paso on April 11th, titled What the Rest of Texas Can Learn from El Paso. And in Austin on April 20th, we partner with UT Austin's OBJ Urban Lab on the future of Texas downtowns. Who are downtowns for? You can learn more about these events at texastribune.org slash events. Now let's get to know our panel. Robert D. Bullard is Distinguished Professor of Urban Planning and Environmental Policy and Founding Director of the Bullard Center for Environmental and Climate Justice at Texas Southern University. He is co-founder of the HBCU Climate Change Consortium and the National Black Environmental Justice Network. Often called the father of environmental justice, he is the author of 18 books, including his latest, The Wrong Complexion, for protection, how the government responds to disaster endangers African American communities. Sarah Jewett is Fervo Energy's Vice President of Strategy. In this role, she runs multiple corporate functions, including corporate strategy, policy and regulatory engagement, external affairs, people operations, and future business lines. Prior to joining Fervo, she worked in corporate development and strategic initiatives for select energy services and she started her career in the oil field, running hydraulic fracturing crews across the Western United States and Alaska for Schlumberger. Brett Perlman serves as the CEO of the Center for Houston's Future, a nonprofit organization working to address matters of highest importance to the long-term future of the greater Houston region. His career has spanned senior positions in business, government, and community service organizations. His career uh, Perlman served for four years as a commissioner on the Public Utility Commission of Texas, where he was appointed in 1999 by then Governor George W. Bush. And our moderator today, Emily Foxhall, is the Texas Tribune's climate reporter. 
She joined the Tribune as an energy reporter in December 2022, focused on the state's transition to green, ener green energy, the reliability of the power grid, and the environmental impact of electricity generation. Emily is based here in Houston, where she grew up. Leading up to today's event, Emily's published a series of stories this, this week focused on hydrogen, geothermal, and small nuclear re reactors. I encourage you to visit texastribune.org to read them. I thank our panel and our audience for being here in Houston and online. And with that, I turn the program over to Emily. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thanks. It's so great to see everybody in the room, and I hope you're as excited as I am about this amazing group of people we're going to hear from today. Um, these have been really fascinating technologies for me to learn about. So like Matt said, even if you're familiar with them or not, I hope this discussion um, is useful and engaging for you. So we're going to start with a quick five-minute-ish overview from each of our panelists about the technologies and their work. And we'll start that with Brett, who is going to tell us a bit about hydrogen. Well, well, thanks, uh, Emily. And thanks to Texas Tribune for inviting me to be part of this exciting panel. And I just want to tell you how honored I am to be on a panel with two pioneers in their own right. Uh, Dr. Bullard is um, really the pioneer of um, environmental justice and... Um, has really had a major influence on all of our thinking about, about ener the energy and the energy future. And Sarah's company is a pioneer in another way, a pioneer in technology, and uh, very anxious to, uh, to hear what you have to say. So I, I'm really pleased to be with you all and with the audience too, uh, to hear and, uh, from you on what you all are thinking about um, uh, our energy future. So I thought I'd start out um, just by giving a little bit of background uh, last week, as many of you know, was the Sierra Week uh, conference here in Houston. And um, as part of that conference, uh, which attracts many luminaries, Bill Gates was here, and he came to Texas uh, because he wanted to see the future of energy because he believes that the Lone Star State is showing the world how to power a cleaner tomorrow. Um, I had the chance to meet with Mr. Gates uh, to talk about clean hydrogen's role in the energy future. And I told him that if he really wanted to understand the future of energy in Texas and the role that hydrogen might play, he needed to look to the past. Because in my lifetime, I've seen three energy revolutions. The first revolution was the shale revolution, which transformed Texas from a declining oil and gas producer to a world leader in oil and gas production. As recently as 2008, volumes of oil and gas production had declined to less than a million barrels a day after four decades of steady decline. But following the shell revolution, we've had a 15-year run of interrupted growth averaging 14% a year, reaching over 6 million barrels per day this year. This remains an important energy engine for our economy and a cornerstone of the clean hydrogen revolution, as I'll explain. The second revolution was renewables. And this has transformed Texas into the Saudi Arabia of wind and solar. And when I was on the Public Utility Commission, I had uh, something to do with that and at least setting the framework, although I will confess that I didn't see that bright future. And that's one of the reasons I didn't want to miss this one in hydrogen. Uh, today, uh, Texas leads the nation in wind, solar, and energy storage. We have over 40 gigawatts of wind and 12 gigawatts of solar, and we're building six gigawatts of batteries. And just to make those numbers uh, meaningful, uh, it, they are quite meaningful when you realize that we set a record recently where over 70% of the energy on our grid came from wind and solar power. This is both decarbonizing our grid and lowering costs. And I believe that these two revolutions will set us up for the development of clean hydrogen, which will be the next energy revolution. Now, hydrogen is kind of a techie thing. It's the first element on the periodic table. So you might ask, why hydrogen? Well, hydrogen is a light element, but it packs a punch in terms of energy density. In fact, Bill Gates calls it the Swiss army knife of the energy transition because of its potential to substitute for existing fuels in a wide variety of energy applications, from shipping to transportation and aviation. It's also a key ingredient to create ammonia for fertilizer, which is central to farming and the green revolution, and which can be exported around the globe. We produce hydrogen today on the Gulf Coast by transforming natural gas 
and in the future we can make it clean by capturing the carbon. But we can also create hydrogen by taking renewable energy and splitting hydrogen, uh, water, into hydrogen and oxygen. And as it turns out, Texas is a really good place to do this. Uh, we have a large existing pipeline capacity uh, network, 1,600 miles of pipelines. That's about 50% of the dedicated hydrogen pipeline capacity. Uh, we have end-use customers uh, to use hydrogen today in refining and petrochemicals, uh, and we'll need to reduce uh, their carbon emissions. And we'll see other uh, applications in things like trucking and uh, shipping going forward. Uh, we have a lot of storage potential. We can store hydrogen underground and use it as a big battery. In fact, we already have three of the six uh, storage caverns in the world located on the Gulf Coast. And we also have unmatched onshore and offshore storage uh, to lock away CO, that CO2 for decades. We have an industry that knows how to manage hydrogen safely. And as I mentioned, we have cheap and plentiful feedstocks of natural gas and renewable energy, which will be key to producing hydrogen. So that's the, the reason I believe that hydrogen can make us green, not only in decarbonizing our energy sector and showing the rest of the world how it can be done, but it can also bring jobs and economic growth to our economy. And as I'm sure we'll discuss, I believe this growth can be, transform all sectors of our economy and can be done in a just, inclusive way. So thank you for letting me be part of this panel and looking forward to the discussion. Thank you, Brett. You took something very complicated and gave us a good Hydrogen 101, so appreciate that. Sarah, we'll go to you next to talk about geothermal. Sure. Thank you, Emily. Very well done, Brett. I'll try to be quite as polished as you. Um, I also would encourage all of you, I imagine if you are here, you uh, have probably read Emily's three-part series that she just produced um, on energy in the Texas Tribune. I thought it was fantastically well done. We get covered a lot, and I just think that the quality of Emily's reporting was super solid. So thank you, actually, for covering um, your three-part series. I thought it was really good. I'm extra nervous today because my mom's in the audience. So um, if, you, if you sense some nerves, you know, I've got to get them out because she's here. Um, my name is Sarah Jewett. I'm the Vice President of Strategy for Fervo Energy, a Houston-based geothermal energy startup or company. Who's to say? We're trying to figure out now whether we've crossed the Rubicon to company from startup. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about geothermal as a whole because I'm sure most of my answer assembly's questions will focus on Fervo perspectives. But the geothermal energy industry is not a new industry. Actually, hy hydrogen is also not a new industry. So here we are on sort of, you know, take two or three of these old industries. And geothermal has been around since the first direct use heating system was installed in Boise, Idaho in 1890. And then the first geothermal large scale power facilities were built in the 1950s and 60s in the state of California. So a lot of people scratch their heads when geothermal comes back into the conversation now and they say, okay, why are we talking about geothermal again? It's never really been a big part of our energy discussion. So why is it now all of a sudden? And I think one of the best ways to explain that is to look to the market and to look to technology development. So from a market perspective, I don't know if you all are sort of as, you know, electricity load wonks as the rest of us, but the electricity load is being rumored to increase at a pretty massive rate right now. We're electrifying a huge number of things, including vehicles, home appliances, things that you all are familiar with. We are also onshoring a lot of manufacturing. Um, we're building data centers for AI. We're doing a lot of things that are, for the first time in a while, really causing projections of energy demand to sort of fly off the chart. And we're not sure how much it's going to fly off the chart. But it's a really interesting concept. Um, today, we are you know, a huge producer of oil and gas. We actually have a really robust clean energy economy. But when you look at load forecasts and load demand growth, you sort of think, OK, how are we going to cover this load, especially at a time when we are trying to decarbonize our energy sector? And so one of the interesting things that that leads you to is we're looking for reliable power that can be always on, that sort of has a fossil energy profile, but that is clean. And then the third leg of the stool is affordable. And I'm sure we'll talk about that too. But you want 
power that is affordable, power that is always on, that allows you to charge your phone when you need it and do what you need to do when you want to do it. And also, it's clean. So for the longest time when we've thought about clean energy, we've thought about it sort of as a supplement to our fossil fuel base. Fossil fuels produce all the time, clean energy is gonna come on as sort of an adder to that. I think what we're seeing now is utilities, corporations, the federal government, everyone wants to build a much larger part of their, part of their portfolio that's actually just clean, and so they're needing more of that reliable base load to be clean. So there's been a really big spotlight shined on 24 seven carbon free energy that can be fielded by nuclear energy, some biomass, hydropower at times when you're not in extreme drought, and geothermal energy. So there's been renewed focus on geothermal power for that reason. And then at the same time, something happened that was led by Texas called the shale revolution. We're trying to access energy that exists below the surface of the earth. It's not quite as easy as wind and solar where you can observe the conditions that you're trying to build a project in. You actually have to drill into the earth to understand what temperature looks like, what rocks look like, things like that. And so the shale revolution is hugely meaningful to the ability of geothermal energy to proliferate in many different types of ways. Um, there's just a massive amount of technology that didn't exist in the 1950s and 60s when the first project started to come on. So geothermal has kind of been this historically really niche industry with very specific use cases that now all of a sudden has a much broader use case because we have all of this technology developed by, in large part by Texans, I like to think it was all Texans, um, that we can deploy to extract heat from the earth. So I am representing the geothermal power industry. That means we are drilling into the earth, we're extracting heat, we're generating electricity with that heat, and then we're putting it on the power grid to serve load. Um, there are other types of geothermal energy. You can use the heat directly. You know, you can actually co-locate, say, um, a direct air carbon capture plant that needs heat in order to uh, eject carbon from its filters. You can actually locate that directly next to a geothermal facility and use the heat directly. Um, and then there's also geothermal for residential heating and cooling. And so when I answer Emily's questions, I'll be talking about the sort of grid connected utility scale power part of the industry. It was so interesting to me to think about geothermal because I even date it back to ancient times, you know, like these natural hot springs or hot pools that people have been using to relax in. Maybe you've gotten to do that on a trip or um, cook with. Yeah, right. Um, and so one distinction I do want to add is um, what these new geothermal companies are doing is finding a way to get the heat out of the earth, even where there is no water or steam, right? Okay, so that's new and shiny. <laughs> okay, and Dr. Bullard, if you um, can can root us in the environmental justice discussion here and, and give us an overview from your perspective. Well, thanks, uh, thanks a lot. Um, and uh, I want to thank uh, Texas Tribune for holding this, this forum. Uh, my name is uh, Robert Bullard. I am a sociologist. Uh, and I'm an environmentalist. I have been working for more than four decades uh, on the intersection of issues around environment, uh, policy, uh, and justice. Uh, I've written 18 books over the last 40 years covering a range of issues from health, environment, climate, energy, disaster, transportation, food and water security, dot, dot, dot. It's 18 books, but it's just one book, but don't tell anybody. <laughs> My job as a sociologist has been connecting the dots with justice, fairness, and equity uh, being the central glue that will hold all those volumes together. When we talk about uh, environment, climate, energy, uh, health, we need to be uh, uh, cognizant of the fact that over the years we've had technology, we've had advances uh, that have been made, benefits, opportunities uh, that oftentimes uh, those benefits and opportunity are dispersed, whereas the costs are localized. Those who live closest to uh, where the externalities 
uh, are created oftentimes receive few of the benefits. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to understand this. If you live across the fence from an, a refinery, uh, LNG export terminal, a chemical plant, plastics plant, or whatever that facility is, living across the fence, living closest to it, uh, does not give you an automatic uh, a right to or an opportunity to those benefits of jobs, economic development, uh, or other kinds of opportunities. So what we're talking about is an issue of equity and justice. In a lot of my research and other research uh, across the country, in looking at this old technology, oil and gas, uh, without a doubt, there's overwhelming evidence that fence line communities bear the burden uh, for the externalities in terms of what's happening uh, if there's an explosion or if there's an accident or if there's just uh, pollution emitted from operations. If you look at the fence line communities uh, across Texas, across the Gulf Coast, across the United States, uh, when we look at, uh, for example, refineries, the communities that are closest to the facilities, uh, say within two mile, three mile radius, that, that, that have uh, the greatest cancer risk, for example, 50% uh, of those residents at risk are people of color. If you look at the fence line communities across Texas, uh, there's no relationship, or there is a relationship in terms of, and it's an inverse relationship, in terms of having an economic renaissance being created for those fence line communities. It's just not there. So when we talk about uh, a place like Port Arthur, one of the poorest uh, cities in the city, in, in, uh, in, in, the, in the state, is one of the largest refineries in the country, but it has not brought about an economic renaissance to Port Arthur. So we have to talk about how do we ensure that as we transition to a clean energy economy that we don't build this new economy on a flawed, uh, unequal system when it comes to those benefits, not just for the workers, but also for business operations as well as those um, residents who are uh, on the front line and fence line. So when we talk about the science, the data, the facts. My question is, as a scientist, one who, who value uh, science, data, and facts, where's the National Academy of Science, Engineering, Medicine study saying that hydrogen works and is a real climate solution to, uh, in, in terms of where we are now? Or where is the study showing National Academy all three of them, that CCS uh, works and is a reliable, uh, uh, scientifically validated climate solution. The same communities that are oftentimes, historically, that have borne the negative impacts of pollution, and I'll give you a fact, America is segregated and so is pollution. You look at Houston, we know where the Houston Ship Channel is located. You look at the, the communities that, are, that line the Ship Channel, these are not economically rich communities. They're disproportionately impacted in terms of the health disparities, economic inequality, and disproportionately represented by people of color. Now, what I'm saying is that if we are to proceed and move forward in warp speed, there needs to be more caution, there needs to be more data, more, more gathering of the facts and assembling those facts so that we do not make the same mistakes in the past of, of somehow pushing out risky, unproven technology for the sake of the fact that there's billions of dollars 
from the federal government, tax dollars now subsidizing hydrogen hubs and CCS. So, so as an environmental justice researcher, scholar, and one who cares about justice, fairness, and equity, and with health of vulnerable communities uh, given top priority, I say that we need to make sure that what we move out does no harm. Because if we are basically building on inequality and going down the same path, it is not a future for anybody. And it's definitely not a future for Texas or the US or the world if we're talking about arresting and addressing uh, climate and moving away from fossil fuels. I'll stop because you give a professor a microphone, he could go on. <laughs> I won't use the time. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I want to start this discussion um, just acknowledging the big context of climate change, which is, of course, this huge problem that the whole globe is having to face. And uh, climate change is being caused in large part because humans are burning fossil fuels, which emit greenhouse gases. And, and that's why we're here to talk about hydrogen and geothermal, because when you burn hydrogen in a fuel cell and when you operate geothermal, those aren't emitting greenhouse gases. But like uh, Bob told us, there's concerns um, about this long legacy of uh, environmental justice. And with each of these technologies, a lot of people are watching to make sure that those patterns don't repeat. So I want to go back to you, Brett, because um, when we use this term CCUS, that means carbon capture. And um, you can make hydrogen, like Brett said in his opening remarks, from natural gas and then capture the CO2. So that's a way that uh, supporters of hydrogen say you can clean up the process for making it. And um, on the other side, there's a lot of people who, who just don't trust that carbon capture is going to be as clean as supporters say it will be. And so they don't believe that hydrogen made from natural gas or from methane is where federal funding should be going, where companies should be investing money. So I'd love if you could address that criticism, Brett. Uh, yeah, and and just to be clear, I'm not here as a as an advocate for any particular technology, uh, but we have studied a lot of these technologies at the center. And uh, Dr. Bullard, I you know I, I don't know if there's a national um, academy study. I'll have to go look at that. Um, but there have been a number of um, energy uh, IEA and, and the Department of Energy have done a, no, a number of studies on um, on the use of uh, you know these technologies, uh, whether it's um, uh, the, uh, the what we call blue, and I, I don't like the colors for a reason I'll explain in a minute, but when we talk about hydrogen, people sometimes talk about the colors of hydrogen, which we use as a shorthand. So we talk about gray, which means uh, basically hydrogen that's produced with natural gas where the CO2 isn't captured. We talk about blue, which is um, hydrogen with carbon capture, uh, which you um, uh, mentioned. And then we talk about uh, green, uh, which is... Um, uh, hydrogen that's created by splitting water, and I won't get into pink and white and all the other different colors, but uh, that's why we, uh, but I think the thing that, the through line for all these different ways of producing hydrogen is carbon intensity. And so the idea, why would we want to do this? <clears throat> We'd want to do it because we can reduce the, um, the amount of greenhouse gases that we put into the atmosphere today. And so if you produce hydrogen with, and it's not abated, uh, it has a lot of CO2 in it. Uh, and we won't talk. We can't talk about local air pollution as well. The um, the communities that surround some of these refineries, uh, you know, have issues with um, uh, particulate ma particulate matter from diesel trucks. They have issues with um, uh, 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 nitrogen oxide and SO2. So there's a lot of different pol uh, pollutants, uh, ozone that's created. It's not just um, uh, carbon that we need to focus on. It's these other. Uh, local um, sources of pollution too. But the theory of the case for using um, hydrogen as a tool for decarbonization is, um, is first we want to electrify everything we can. So uh, to the point that Sarah made, the first strategy for addressing uh, our climate crisis is to uh, use electrification. And when we mean electrification, what we really mean is using um, uh, renewable energy. As, as a source of, uh, of that electrification. Because if we're using uh, uh, coal, for example, we're really, or oil, we're not really solving the problem. Uh, natural gas tends to have a lower 
um, uh, uh, you know, effect on greenhouse gases, but still a substantial um, emitter of, uh, of CO2. Um, so when we talk about electrifying everything, we really mean um, using um, renewable energy to power our, our homes, our cars, and everything else. But we can't do that for everything, okay? <clears throat> we can't do that for aviation. Uh, difficult to do it for things like uh, heavy-duty trucking uh, because the batteries are too heavy. Um, and so there are sectors uh, that are a steel, uh, cement that are called hard to abate sectors, and that's where where hydrogen comes in. So just to frame the discussion, that's why we're that's why we're even talking about hydrogen because um, we have to find other tools in the toolkit to decarbonize uh, all of our existing processes if we're going to meet this target of being net zero by 2050. So so that's point one. Now, <clears throat> why do we want to use um, hydrogen produced from natural gas? Um, the reason is is because um, we know how to produce it at scale uh, today in, in um, yeah, at relatively cheaply. And I think we can do it in a way that reduces the carbon emissions at the same time. And so it's somewhat of a technology that will help us get uh, uh, start to address this in a uh, relatively uh, rapid fashion if we believe that we need, need to be on a pathway to reducing our carbon emissions by 2030. And so it is um, one of those technologies uh, that will help us scale quickly. And uh, some of the research shows, and in fact, um, if you look at the emissions, and this has been studied, I'd be curious on Dr. Bullard's thoughts on this. Today we're producing, just to give a number, about um, 10 kilograms of CO2 per kilogram of hydrogen produced. And so that's a relatively uh, high number. The benchmark that is in some of the federal legislation is two kilograms of CO2 per kilogram of hydrogen. And some of the technologies that if we are uh, sequestering uh, the CO2 and if we're making sure we can capture the methane uh, that's produced that it doesn't leak out before the process, we can get those numbers down uh, to um, around that two uh, kilograms of CO2 per kilogram of hydrogen. And so, so that's really why we wanna use uh, that um, technology because it's a technology that helps us to address some of these hard debate sectors and gets us on this path. Um, I will tell you that um, there are exciting things that are coming out of the labs and very interested in the geothermal, but in this hydrogen space, uh, I was at um, A&M a couple weeks ago, and they have a very interesting um, technology using plasma, um, and uh, there's technologies here in Houston that some of the other startups um, You're giving me more stories to report on. Yes, no. <laughs> there are really interesting. Uh, Simvita um, uh, is using um, actually um, uh, synthetic biology to produce um, hydrogen. Um, and I, so there's, there's all these other technologies. I guess my point is in this, we're not just limited to the technologies that are existing today. We're gonna, if we start down this pathway, we're going to start to see other things come to fruition relatively, in a relatively short period of time that I we can't even, you know, can't even imagine today. And right, so, that, so that's the reason we need to get started and why the, we need to start with what we have and then improve it over time. That's what I would say in terms of your question. Thanks. Right. And it, it sounds like what you're saying is you do believe that carbon capture can bring those uh, carbon emission rates down. Yeah, I, I think it is. A, and this, you know, a, it's a great conversation to have with Dr. Bullard because it is a, a trust but verify sort of thing. If we're not, if we're not making sure that we are hitting these targets, you know, then we're not accomplishing the goal. And so this idea of, um, of thinking about ways of uh, measuring and ver uh, validating uh, carbon intensity is really key uh, to making this uh, a success. Okay. Um, we'll get to you, Dr. Bullard, one moment. <laughs> I, I wanna bring up the challenges facing geothermal too, um, which are that in the past, some geothermal projects have been linked to earthquakes because of course, you're going down into the surface, uh, subsurface of the earth. And um, the uh, some people have brought up some environmental concerns with potential water problems that uh, my reporting didn't get into, but I wanted to raise just in case that's something, Sarah, you um, want to address. Yeah, I'd love to, especially because hearing Dr. Bullard talk um, hits a real chord with me. I'm actually the liaison responsible for, for all of our community engagement and stakeholder affairs at Fervo. And I spend a lot of time in Beaver County, Utah because of that, which is a very underserved community. 
whose biggest form of employment when we rolled into town was large hog farms that they sent to California for slaughter. Um, these fog hog farms have actually now closed because of a proposition that happened in the state of California and the community is in a pretty dire um, state of emergency because they have lost the single largest non-ag employer in the county. And the whole county has about 9,500 people residing in it, including children. Um, so I think we think a lot about building a, a project that lasts not just for the environment, but for the communities where we work. About 60% of our staff comes from the oil and gas industry and got a front row seat to how community engagement is not done well with fracking across the United States, myself included. Um, I ran frack crews in Rock Springs, Wyoming. At the same time, my aunt was the legislative director for the Sierra Club in Denver. And we had some really interesting conversations about um, basically big oil's treatment of community feelings around fracking. And so I am a fracking expert, thankfully, and so can hold my company to really high accountability and high standards when it comes to any is issues associated with fracking and water pollution. But I think we've basically taken a stance that if what we're doing impacts the community in a negative way, the accounting doesn't shake out. And I don't think that we would get into a position where we say, yes, we're causing earthquakes, and yes, we are poisoning water tables, but it's so important for the climate that we're doing what we're doing that we're gonna keep going. I think the only way we think about establishing a sustainable solution that sort of leads us into our future is one that actually, yes, addresses what we're trying to solve from a climate perspective, but also from a community perspective is inclusive and sort of at worst benign rather than detrimental. Um, so yes, two of the biggest issues for geothermal energy are one, water pollution as it relates to fracking, and two, seismicity, which is inducing earthquakes in the earth. Um, number two, we got to see firsthand recently, Fervo Energy uh, performed its very first frack out in Beaver County. We fracked two wells and we did see increased seismic activity in the area as a result of that. Um, you can read all about it on our website. We try to be really, really open about what is happening. Um, so the same thing that makes geothermal energy uh, reservoirs really high quality are basically plates in the earth are sort of pulling apart that allows heat to, this is very simple, sort of rise to the surface. And so they are typically very seismically naturally active zones, meaning that if we never came there, the community sees seismic activity all the time. And so we, uh, for better or for worse, get to deal with a seismically active zone just by rolling into town. And so when we start pumping a bunch of water and sand into the earth, you can sort of activate some of that seismic activity. Um, and there are, there are established practices established by the Department of Energy and a bunch of seismic experts that say in the event that you're pumping a lot of high pressure water into a seismically active zone, this is how you control the impact. And this is how you control man-made fractures or man-made induced seismic events. And it's this whole very intensive stoplight procedure where if you see this activity, you know, you have this coordinated response and you have to have this amount of measurement on surface. You have to have this amount of third parties validating your data so you're not the sole validator of your data. You have to have a really intensive communication system, not only within the company, but within stakeholders in the area, within the community. And so during this frack, when we were seeing increased seismic activity, which could not be felt on the surface, I was on the phone with community leaders basically all day, every day, for a couple of weeks. Um, just double checking, you know, you all haven't seen anything, heard anything, how are your citizens feeling, how's it going over there, um, have you been out to the site, you know, what is your seismometer on the high school, uh, at the high school campus reading, those types of things. Um, and then we held, you know, some pretty intensive town halls afterwards where anyone hearing rumors or picking up rumors in the community could come talk to us about what they'd heard. So it is not uh, an operation without risks. But I think the way that Fervo views it is if we cause, you know, a magnitude four earthquake that can be felt on surface and that 
God forbid, destroys buildings or has negative impacts on buildings in the local community, then we've sort of lost our social license to operate and we have lost our ability to say, we're gonna go proliferate this at really large scale in any proximity to communities. And so I think we see the two as incredibly closely linked at this point in time and that's sort of how we approach it as a company trying to build a truly sustainable, well-rounded solution. So seismicity is something you can monitor constantly as you're operating, right? You can, yes. Okay, okay thank you. Yeah, so we've actually, we have some pretty good data for, from long operating assets in the state of California who experienced some pretty intensive seismicity during construction, and there have not appeared to be any really long-lasting effects. In some cases, actually, when you sort of trigger some of this induced seismicity, it could actually relieve some of the pressure that the reservoir is sitting under naturally and kind of mend the, seismic, or the seismic risk that it's under. I think what, what it varies, um, it will vary sort of geography to geography and depend on how active the seismic zone is prior to entering that area. And so, um, you know, I think it'll be really monitored on a project by project basis. We're gonna try to wait for questions if you don't mind just give us a little bit more time. Um, I wanna let Bob respond to what both of them have said. And the question that I've been thinking about is, should companies be given a chance to prove that they can do it differently or do it better? Or are some of these technologies just so concerning that you don't think they um, should have that chance? So a, a response to both of them and maybe some thoughts on that question. Well, I, I think it's important that uh Communities that have lived with the negative impacts and externalities of some of the same companies that are now talking about, uh, trust me, I will do the right thing when it comes to uh, hydrogen and CCS, CCUS. Trust me, we will do the right thing. Even when they have not come to communities uh, and seeking out uh, what are the community's concerns, response, uh, in a way, uh, in terms of allaying their fears. The location of these potential hubs uh, was not selected in a democratic process. Community did not vote to get these things. These were decisions that were made by application to a federal agency DOE that was pushing this out as uh, money, billions of dollars available. So this is not a democratic process and this is not a process that where the communities are saying, if, do we have veto power to say we don't want any more uh, pollution on us. And what you're talking about here is hydrogen. I'm talking about hydrogen, hydrogen hubs, and the same places where communities are overloaded with pollution from uh, chemical plants, oil and gas. Uh, and so if you look at the the proximity of where these potential hydrogen hubs and CCUS, I mean, we're talking about, in some cases, the same communities. So, so where, is the, where is the relief that these communities are getting? And where we're looking at climate solution is more than greenhouse gases and parts per million when it comes to uh, carbon. It's also those other co-pollutants that we're talking about. While we're talking about building out this, the, these hydrogen hubs, these communities are also are still experiencing the pollution from the diesel trucks running through, from the accidents and explosion and shelter in place and all the other uh, things. So that this hydrogen, this so-called new technology, is extending the life of these same fossil fuel industry plants, etc. There's and so. The two things really don't jive. While we're talking about moving fast and furious forward with climate solutions, these communities are still having to live with this old pollution, polluting that's still coming out uh, and, 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 and creating problems. The, the justice, fairness, and equity lens is not applied to where these um, projects are going. And I do think that, and again, our gold standard for, for deploying 
in a, in a, a large scale, new technology, in most cases, there are studies done, not studies uh, funded by and sponsored by the industry, but independent studies that are done. Uh, and for us, who, who, who believe in uh, National Academy studies that, that oftentimes uh, uh, where you get something that's uh, not only credible, believable, but it's also backed up uh, and enforced with resource dollars by Congress. But there's nothing like that. Cong and I'm going to be blunt. My name is Bob, but I'm going to be frank. Uh, <laughs> Billions of dollars have been sent out the door uh, by DOE uh, for, for these hydrogen hubs, and these sites are selected. And in many cases, uh, communities hearing about it, reading about it in the newspaper. There are communities that are going to be not hosting these things, but things that have been, been given to them uh, without their consent or whatever. There's no consent to getting a facility. There's no consent form uh, where you say, I sign this and wave away my rights, and you can come on in and, and do what you got to do. Now, we did a study like this with human subjects. We'd have, to, we'd have to file a human subjects, go through that process. But this, you don't have to do that. And we said there's something wrong with giving or, or pushing something into a place a space and a community without their consent. And it's not random. Many of the people, most of the people in this room don't have to worry about this. Because people in this room don't look like the communities surrounding these facilities. That's not a jab or a slight. It's a fact. So, so when we talk about justice and fairness and equity and making sure that the industry come under some type of overarching um, framework not to make the mistake that they made in the past when communities are inundated. I did a study in 1979, 44 years ago, looking at pollution and race in Houston. It was looking at waste. But if you can extrapolate the same thing from waste sites to, to cement crushing plants to polluting chemical plants to explosions, accidents across the Gulf Coast, and if you look in, inside of Texas, it's the same process reproducing itself. And what I'm saying is I want this, um, this emergency alarm to go off. Let's not allow history to repeat itself so that we have smart people who can come up with real climate solutions, not false solutions. So I, I think what I hear you saying is that maybe there is a world in which hydrogen could be good, but you want to see the, the proof of that first. I want to see the proof, and I want to see more of it dealing with, uh, with the color, uh, with, with using renewables. But if I'm not mistaken, a lot of them are saying, well, we're, just going, we're going to use natural gas. Well, we're talking about moving away from, from methane. We call it natural gas. Uh, so, so, and, and we know methane is a powerful greenhouse gas pollutant. So when we talk about continuing to use this unnatural gas or natural gas, I won't be, uh, 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 anyway, natural gas in the process of a climate solution, we're, we're extending out the use of fossil fuels as opposed to moving away. I mean, this, it's contradictory. And so everybody knows these hydrogen hubs that we're talking about. The Federal Department of Energy has offered up to $7 billion uh, for a number of projects. And there was a Gulf Coast group of companies that came together and applied for this money and has been awarded up to $1.2 billion. So because we're the Texas Tribune and because we're here in Houston, I, I do want to get quickly to this issue of how Texas is playing a role in all three of these technologies. And um, I think as this conversation is kind of building around, there, um, there are advantages for these companies to being in Texas and there's reasons that these companies are headquartered here in Houston and elsewhere in Texas. But there's also this long, you know, history that companies are having to operate within. So, Brett, can you speak a little more to why um, 
either for Houston or for Texas, hydrogen um, makes sense here and maybe also continuing to address these criticisms and these challenges for the for the state and locally. Well, again, um, you know, my role here is just to more not as an advocate, but just as kind of a um, someone to sort of provide information. And I think, you know, Dr. Bullard makes a lot of great points. In fact, he's been such a um, uh, an important advocate for this that a lot of these things that we're talking about are now embedded within the discussion that are, are being had um, in the industry. So this whole concept, and this is kind of why I said I'm honored to be on the panel with him, this idea of environmental justice um, didn't exist, you know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago and until uh, Dr. Bullard created it. And that idea of environmental justice is now embedded within the core of the work that has to be done uh, as part of this, these DOE grants. And so what I mean by that is um, uh, as we put together, and uh, we were part at the center of an application that was submitted, it's called High Velocity. It is one of the seven hubs. And I wanted to define what a hub is in a second. But one of the big areas of focus, in fact, um, one of the things that um, you know, we're still trying to figure out um, is, is how do we work with these communities? How do we, how do we engage the communities in a two-way dialogue? How do we show that the benefits, uh, because part of the uh, part of creating a community benefits plan is to show that 40% of the benefits will benefit those in communities where these, resor these, um, these um, uh, resources might go. And, and so it, it's becoming, I think a, it's a different um, day and age. I, I don't think it's going to be perfect, but I think it's going to uh, hope to start down this path of making sure that there is a more inclusive way of thinking about development and certainly in addressing all the, uh, the problems that Dr. Bullitt has written about you know, very eloquently over the, uh, the, the course of his career. Um, I think one thing that's important to know is um, uh, in terms of what a hydrogen hub is, let me kind of talk about that, and I can talk a little bit about <clears throat> what um, the one that we're working on is. It's not um, the the hub that we submitted um, did not have specific locations yet. We're still the companies that are going to build the, and there are seven of them that are going to build these projects, are still in the very early stages of uh, selecting locations. And I think one of the things that will happen as we get this process started, because we haven't been awarded the money yet. We've been selected. We were selected on October 13th at, a, um, at a, um, uh, a, um, uh, an announcement that President Biden did in, in Philadelphia. Um, but we're still in the negotiation phase. And a lot of the um, discussion right now is how do we make these community benefit plans? How do we implement them? How do we draw in uh, these communities where these assets might be? Uh, to have these sort of discussions. And, and really, there, have been, there hasn't been any uh, uh, dollars flowing at all from DOE for any of these projects, um, at least on the hydrogen side. Uh, so we're at very early stages. I, I tell some people that we're not even in the first inning of the game. We're still waiting for the national anthem to be sung. I, I guess I wonder, though, why do this in Texas at all? Like, why here? Well, the reason, uh, because Texas, as I was trying to explain when we started, is Texas is an energy state. And um, we have a lot of the, the natural resources for this, uh, both in terms of, remember, we're, we spend a lot of time talking about natural gas, and it's true, we're, uh, natural gas is an important part of our energy mix, but renewables are a big, uh, important part of our energy mix, too. So we have this, um, uh, this natural endowment of energy resources. We also have sort of the intellectual capital. Uh, we have um, a number of energy companies that are here. Uh, that know how to deal with these, um, uh, as as Sarah mentioned, you know, none of these technologies are particular, you know, by definition, um, you know, harmless. They all have to be managed carefully, and so we do have the uh, the, the 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 skills and capability, the engineering talent uh, to do it. Um, and then I think the you know the the, the third sort of uh, piece of it is um, um, we we uh, we do have the um, you know, the, the, the physical assets here as well um, that have been built over time. And I acknowledge that a lot of these are in the communities that Dr. Bullard is talking about. So, so Texas tends to be a pretty good place uh, for energy. It's a big part of our state economy. And um, the physical assets, the, um, the resources that we have and the intellectual assets make, make it a, a good place to, um, uh, to develop these sort of plants. So what we have to do is we have to do this in a way that makes it 
uh, that minimizes the, um, the, the, um, the harms and, and maximizes the benefits. And that's, that's the equation that we have to start to get right. Okay. We'll move to questions in about five minutes. So if you guys want to be thinking, um, Sarah, I, uh, the story we did, um, this week looks at three geothermal companies that are all here in Houston. So I would love if you could also speak to why, um, for geothermal, it makes sense to headquarter here and what are the reasons that Texas makes us a good place to be working on that subject? Yeah, so we are headquartered in Houston. One, from a human capital perspective, we have a lot of people in our business who have oil and gas expertise, and a lot of them you know, are already located here. So when we look to hire a reservoir engineer or geologist, we will often hire them away from a job in fossil fuels. So workforce is really big for us. Um, even though our projects right now are in the western U.S., where there's really solid heat at shallow depths, Texas could be an interesting place to do geothermal in the future. The, the hot resources are just a bit deeper and in the state of Texas. And then the other thing was just being near our suppliers. We are using modern rigs from Helmer and Payne. They have a big yard and a big presence in Houston. We are using you know, modern, modern oil field services from every single of the big names, Schlumberger, Halliburton, Baker, um, Liberty and lots of them have big presences in Houston. And so it's an easy place for us to sort of do business, have technical partnerships and um, design our projects. So that's sort of why we're here. I would also add the airport makes it nice to travel to all of our very rural locations. So spend a lot of time on planes. Sure. Okay, Bob, you get the policy question. I, I'm just wondering, looking forward, is there state policy that would make a difference here as these technologies um, move ahead? Is there federal policy that would make a, d a difference? Um, uh, just speaking in terms of this energy transition going forward, what are ways that governments could be considering um, you know, having, having more guardrails in place? Well, well, you know, I uh, let me ask that question by saying I, I've uh, I've witnessed two signings of executive orders, uh, presidential executive orders, uh, 1994 with uh, environmental justice executive order by uh, Bill Clinton, as February 1994, and I witnessed an executive order signed uh, April 21st. 2023 by President Biden, Environmental Justice Executive Order. The reason why we have executive orders is because we don't have any federal legislation that would build in environmental justice, fairness, and equity into uh, policies that we're talking about now. Uh, there's a federal uh, initiative called Justice 40 that President Biden administration, Biden-Harris administration has that looks at, uh, as we transition to a clean energy economy, 40% of the benefits are, are uh, are supposed to accrue to what, what, what he calls uh, disadvantaged communities. Uh, this is not a law, uh, it's, not a man, it's not a federal mandate, but it is one of, the, um, one of the principles that's embedded into uh, the monies that DOE is pushing out. It doesn't mean that these are goals. It doesn't mean that as the money gets pushed out to uh, the different states and hubs that it will somehow be one set of rules that are applied equally across the 50 states. We have 50 states in the country. We have 10 regions. All regions are not created equal. We are, Texas is in region six. And region four and region six have been problem children when it comes to our region enforcement of not only just environmental laws, but also civil rights laws, equal protection, when it comes to addressing these whole disparities when it comes to environment. So there, we got 50 states and, and even our own uh, state agencies that are put in place to uh, protect the environment and public health are different. Our TCEQ uh, is very different than some of the other state agencies uh, outside of the South. I won't call any names, but we know they are different. Uh, and so 
it would be great if Texas would pass a law, the legislature would pass a law that would build in the issues around environmental justice and climate justice initiatives as we talk about transitioning, like some other states have done. California, Oregon, Washington State, Ohio, Michigan, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Connecticut, Massachusetts. Now, not a single southern state has passed a law. We don't expect them to. But the idea is that communities are, that, are, that are suffering, the, the, the fact that where you live, your zip code in your state can determine whether or not you get the kinds of safeguards that, that we're uh, talking about in, when it comes to this transition. So if you, got, if you live in a zip code in Texas where this is happening, you're more likely not to get the kinds of protection than if you lived in Connecticut uh, Yankee land. So, so we, but we have one, one uh, set of rules as it, reply, as, it, as it applies in terms of uh, the equal protection, civil rights, as well as National Environmental Policy Act, NEPA, as, as well as Clean Air Act. Just one law. But how it gets interpreted as it hits the ground, it, it somehow gets um, treated differently depending on where you are and where you live and whether or not your attorney general is going to sue the federal government if, because they want to enforce the Clean Air Act or they want to put a pause on LNG export terminals. And you know it's 20 whatever attorney generals. We know what states they're from. They're from states... And I won't call any name, but there's one initial, TX. <laughs> so when we talk about this, yes, all states are not created equal. So, so it would be great if we had states that would take the initiative on this. But Texas is not one of those states that would take the initiative when it comes to um, environmental, climate justice, and equal protection under the law. TCEQ has told us that, that their permitting process and the way they enforce it has nothing to do with civil rights. They have told us that. And so we're on our own, brothers and sisters. We're on our own in Texas. Thank you. This has all, there was one conversation I had when reporting this story with somebody who said, you know, none of these technologies is the silver bullet. And that has really changed the way I think about all of this. It's like there's a lot of reasons to be excited about some of these clean energy technologies. And then you take a minute and you think about just uh, how much more complex and nuanced this whole uh, conversation is. So, so thank you all. And I'd love, I think we have about 15, 10, 15 minutes for questions. Yeah, so uh, for those who do have questions here in person, we have two mics set up. Uh, we have one on that side of the cameras, one on this side, so you don't need to cross uh, in between. Uh, for those who are joining us online, you can ask your questions at texastribune.org slash ask. Um, I guess the first question comes back, Sarah, to, you know, what does, um, what does community engagement look like? Who are some of those stakeholders um, that you're pulling together? Beyond forums like this, what else is uh, kind of intentional about what different stakeholders in a community you want to pull together for knowledge around what's happening and to be able to get their input? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I've been getting fired up listening to uh, Dr. Bullard and new passion for the things that we're doing, actually. Um, I actually think that, so we're building a, a very large 400 megawatt geothermal energy project in Beaver County, Utah, which is a rural area. This is our first large greenfield development. I think we benefit because the community is actually really very small. So it's been able to get, I've been really able to get our arms around, you know, who are the key stakeholders? What are the communication pathways? How do mayors communicate with the people that they represent? What are the county commissioners like? What do they care about? Um, 
you know, how does the, the ag community in the county feel and how is that different from those working in, in other different non-ag industries? So I think generally the small community has been kind of like a nice place for us to have a first project because they've been incredibly, incredibly helpful. And whenever they have feedback, they give it to me very directly um, and very openly. And I think that is probably a result of me building um, really deep, strong, trusting relationships with them and being there a lot. So what does community engagement look like? Brett mentioned that as part of any Department of Energy grant application, you have to build a community benefits plan. And I would actually say it's a nice forcing function from the Department of Energy, but community benefits plan and what's required of the Biden administration is not actually always exactly what the community needs and what the community wants. So the, the community benefits plan focuses on Justice 40. They focus on how you are working on you know, supplier diversity in your supply chain. They focus on a number of things like this. Um, we are working in a, in a pretty non-diverse county, and I can tell you that you know, t encouraging diversity in local job creation is not one of the key things that necessarily the community where we're working is all about, but they are really, really, really concerned with local employment and local job creation. So that's sort of number one for them. So I think community engagement for us has, has really been about going to the community and asking them, what are the things that are most important to you? Not only that, how do you like to be communicated with? And then really educating them and keeping them up to speed with what we're doing, how big it is, how much truck traffic they can expect through their town in times of increased activity, things like that. We've done a really diligent job forecasting job creation at every single given point in the construction and operations process, how we're gonna house those workers. And then we've actually worked with the local community to think about their city plan. And in the event that we do create 30 jobs in a town of 1,000 people, that's actually pretty meaningful. And so today, they've actually started um, initiating a new community plan study for themselves that says, how do we house if 50 new people come, how are we gonna house those people? And then what are the supporting services that sort of need to be enhanced in order to help accommodate those 50 people? You know, laundromats, food services, schools, things like that. And I think we're trying to be really good partners with them as they think about full community development to sort of take this project on. And what we have stated with them is we don't wanna do anything that you know causes boom and bust. Um, and we have a farm out in Fayette County, Texas, and I think what we've seen out there is there was really wildly increased activity in the Eagleford Shale, and then it sort of died. And lots happened out there um, that is no longer useful, and I think that's what we're really trying to avoid in this local community and trying to figure out how we build with them and not leave a gaping hole if we leave in 2028 after the project is online. Thank you. Uh, we have no, we have uh, two lines here. If you want to ask a question, you're welcome to get in line. Um, so I do. Yep. Yeah, there's two lines here. Um, out of respect for the many people who are here to ask questions, my only ask is that you ask a question with a question mark at the end, <laughs> um, and make sure more voices are better for the conversation. So let's get through as many questions as we can. I'm going to go ahead and start with you, sir. Then we're going to alternate between microphones. Thank you. Um, yeah, th thank you all for, for hosting this event and, and certainly in the topic, uh, very relevant to, to myself, um, but won't belabor you with, with why. Um, but, uh, but most of my questions and very familiar with, with both of kind of the energy uh, components. So for Dr. Bullard, really a more, um, you know, general concept. I, I lived in Galena Park for about 10 years. My, my parents grew up there. So I've, I've seen those communities. I've seen some of the benefits with new schools and things like that that do take place or come with some of these, you know, facilities and industries being co-located with neighborhoods. Um, but, you know, there is this concept of like nimbyism, right? Not in my backyard. Um, some communities can certainly advocate for themselves more than others. We saw that with like the Metro Rail getting in, you know, where it was going to go. We see 
see that right now with 45. Same thing with refineries, right? And and ag, like Sarah mentioned, uh, you know, taking place in in Beaver County. So just curious, what some of your thoughts are? I mean, you know, taking a poll of all the community, who's going to vote? But I mean, at the end of the day, maybe everybody will say, hey, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't want a facility in my backyard. So how do we go about, or what are some of your ideas in terms of, um, you know, how, how does industry, you know, kind of develop within these urban environments and, and what are better ways to kind of go about that than others? Sarah maybe touched on some of those with kind of this community action plan, but but really particularly interested in, in your thoughts based on your, your comments. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I don't propose to speak for Galena Park, Manchester, or Clinton Park, Pleasantville, any of those communities. They have great leaders who speak for themselves. Um, uh, the, the first principle of environmental justice is that, is that the people who are most impacted and who could best benefit from uh, certain types of operations should be in the room when decisions are being made. And, and they need to be consulted when, when major decisions like these projects are being uh, talked about, not after the fact not after the grant is being awarded and not uh, during the process in which sites are being selected. And, and, and they need to know if they're in the bullseye. But oftentimes that's not the way it's done. And what we're saying is change the, di change the dynamics in which decisions are being made during that process so that people can speak for themselves and be in those rooms when decisions are being made and have the information in a timely manner. Now. When we talk about the, the benefits and the burden, the prospects as well as the promise, oftentimes the promise out, uh, exceeds the delivery. And that's not rocket science. So we have, to, we have great ways of, of communities that now are empowered to speak for themselves because of the work that we have doing. We have built a movement. So when, when industries say we don't know how to get to the community, we don't know how to talk to communities, there are ways there are op of engaging, not parachuting in, but going through a rigorous process of engaging communities in a respectful way. And when you do that, people can tell you with a great deal of specificity whether or not they want this or see this as a Justice 40 benefit, a community benefits agreement, or whether it's poison pill laced with sugar, it might taste sweet but it'll still kill you. Now, that's where it comes in into giving all the facts and the science and the data, and the communities have that. And, they, and it's their right to accept, to say, we want this, and it's their right also to say, we do not want any more of this dumped on us, whatever. And too often, those rights are not, uh, are not respected, not just, I'm not just talking about Texas, but across the board, because of power, money, and what's driving it. It's the money that's driving it now. Hi, uh, thank you so much to all of you. My name is Catherine Sorrell, and I'm a, an attorney, excuse me, <clears throat> with a boutique law firm called Cultural Heritage Partners. We represent um, a lot of Native American tribes and other marginalized communities through the permitting process for many infrastructure projects. So much of what you said is incredibly relevant. Um, a lot of times, Natural resources are also cultural resources, so we're working at that intersection too. Just to piggyback off of um, some of what was just said, um, I wanted to ask a two-part question. One is, um, what is the difference between sort of just community engagement and then obtaining consent? So again, back to that sort of difference between a stakeholder versus a rights holder on these projects. And then also, I'm wondering where all of you are seeing the costs of not engaging communities well. So we often see it in our work, for example, in Dakota Access, some of the investors uh, who invested in, in the Dakota Access project lost billions of dollars because they didn't um, get consent from the community or engage those uh, communities well. Um, so where are you all seeing the, the costs, in, whether it's project delays or other types of costs on these projects when um, <clears throat> sorry, I have a cold, uh, when this is not done well. Thank you. Maybe, Bob, you want to start with that, and we'll let Sarah and Brett follow. Yes. Uh, your, your answer is right in terms of uh, all infrastructure is not created equal, and the extent to which, in some cases, infrastructure can be very devastating to communities 
if applied in a way that 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 somehow not only dest destroys the the cultural um, assets but also destroys the 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 infrastructure in terms of the social as well as the the built environment and we could talk about a lot of different projects et cetera that has that have displaced communities and all you see now are are foundations where community used to be there's a huge difference between uh, community engagement and the right of consent. The right of consent right now, uh, as you apply it to the local level and going all the way up to uh, COP meetings, the climate conferences and the summits where communities and even some cases nation states are saying, uh, we have, a, when you talk about bringing something to this country, the, com the country and the communities within that country uh, have a right to refusal in terms of not consenting to their own government saying bring it here as opposed to uh, government to government saying it's okay and the industry bring it. Uh, we have to understand that there has been a lot of devastation uh, wrought on communities by not allowing the voices in those communities to rise to the top of saying no or saying do it differently. Do it as if your grandmother lived next door, but we know they don't. Or do it like if it's in Holland, as opposed to the Netherlands, as opposed to Convent, Louisiana, and Norco, and the Houston Ship Channel. We know they do it differently when the people are different. And what we say is all communities have a right to clean, sustainable, health, to be healthy, and be climate resilient. That's what we're saying now, because we're living in the era of climate change and climate crisis, so we have to be even more careful, because climate change will exacerbate existing inequalities, and those communities are already overburdened and are more vulnerable. Climate change will make them even more vulnerable and at risk. So we can't be counting on, trust me, trust me. No. We can't do that. Sarah and Brett, do either of you want to speak? quickly to the question of the cost of not engaging. And we're going to try to get in a couple more questions too, if we, if we can. Yeah, I think the short of it is it can be incredibly costly. I think, you know, I'm, I'm sitting here thinking about the differences between our project and perhaps a, a Houston Port project that Dr. Bullard is talking about. And our fence line community are the county commissioners. And so I think that that's a really interesting connect that in some ways makes it a little easier on us because they are making decisions in a self-interested way. So if they actually don't approve of something that we are doing, they can, they can have incredible power in stopping the project. And I think that's actually a really nice tie in this way because the incentives are really aligned. Um. I think the ultimate objective here is, is to have these discussions and to get the engagement and consent of the community and to embed that within a enforceable agreement uh, that's called a community benefits agreement. So that, that's the objective. Um, I think we're at the very early stages of this process, um, but that's, that's where we're headed. And I, you know, I think time will tell whether that's something we can, uh, we, we can actually do. And I, when I say we, I mean you know, all of us working together. And so I'm hopeful that that's where we're headed in this discussion, that we create these kind of forums for the, like you're doing today, where we have this dialogue um, back and forth, and then we understand what the issues are. We try to find ways to collectively address those issues and then to embed them into some sort of agreement, which is basically a uh, reflection of what the community wants. And so I think that's where we're trying to head. I just uh, just want to acknowledge that we're at 147. I would love to be able to give a few more people time to ask questions, but I want to make sure our speakers are okay going for about five more minutes. Is that okay? Okay. The gentleman over here has a question. Okay. This is a soft question, and it's a short one. Uh, Brett, this is for you. In your opening remarks, uh, did I understand you to say that 70% of the power produced on the Texas grid is solar and wind? No, what I, what I, well, what I said is there was a, at one point in time, in an hour, that there was, we hit that mark where we were producing 70% of our um, energy through renewables. And that's where, that's an aspiration for how now can we get to, to that. So, um, 
So yes, in that peak hour where we've produced more solar and wind, we were, we were operating the grid on, on high amounts of solar and wind. In California, I was just in California yesterday, they've gotten to 100% renewables. And so we're not doing that around the clock, but that's kind of where we're headed. I'm just trying to give you a vision of where we're trying to go. Um, hi, my name is Paige Powell. I'm a policy manager at Commission Shift, and um, I uh, I wanted to uh, speak to some things that uh, you said earlier, Mr. Perlman. This is for you. I just wanted to uh, make sure you said that the goal was to decarbonize right here, and um, uh, I, I really wanted to come in onto this like consent and community benefits thing, but everybody already kind of brought that up, so I don't have to like go there. I can move to the next thing. Um, they're they're totally different. They're two very different things. Like free prior and informed consent is not the same thing as a community benefits agreement. And I outlined that in the my 15 policy points for responsible carbon management, which you can find on our commission shift website. Um, but I, I just would like to ask you, Mr. Pullman, uh, if, if you, th it seems like if we're really committed to decarbonizing, like we need to find out if CCS and hydrogen are actual climate solutions. And Dr. Bullard said, like, let's get the academies to, to run a study. And then my question to you is, would you be willing to take this back to your board or your associations? I know there are a different, couple of different ones, right? You've got... Um, with a lot of power and influence who might be able to restructure the process because as Dr. Bullard pointed out, this is not democratic and the consent has not happened. And so what can your organization do to renegotiate with DOE how uh, we move forward, at, if at all, with the funding and projects? Yeah. Um, again, our role here is just as a, basically to inform. We're not we, we don't really, we're a nonprofit. We don't really have, um, you know, agency or, 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 or authority to change any of these processes. But we're here, we're, we're basically here um, uh, to be part of the discussion. Uh, and I know that Com Commission Shift is an organization that's been very involved in um, uh, issues around, um, uh, regulatory issues around natural gas. We're obviously very interested in, in, um, in those kind of discussions. but. Our job here is not as a, um, uh, a decision maker. It's certainly um, it's it's here just to be part of a of a dialogue. So I'm very interested in talking to you about what your uh, perspectives are. But you know I don't really have uh, any particular um, authority and any of this to um, you know on on sort of uh, some of the things that you were discussing. Uh, we're we're simply here as a um, uh, you know as an organization to help uh, work on. Uh, furthering the, you know, the dialogue. Next up. <clears throat> yeah, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Doug Peterson. I'm with the uh, Sierra Club Political Committee for the state of Texas uh, and also uh, served uh, Adrian Garcia, Commissioner uh, to Precinct 2 for the Clear Lake area. Um, and I can tell you that um, there are a lot of allies for Dr. Bullard being created all up and down the Bay Area. Uh, that is certainly 225 down 146, and all those communities in Clear Lake have many of the same problems, not to the intensity, but my question is, as I've looked at this, it appears to me TCEQ is weak on budget or desire to enforce. Um, that's one thing. But they continue to support permit after permit after permit uh, and the intensity, or rather the concentration of new infrastructure in the Bay Area is incredible. And, there, and TCUQ seems to be enforcing regulations out of what? The 1940s? You, we got all this concentration going on and it's always yes for more. Uh, so my question is, what can we do to impact that? I don't know, I mean, Dr. Bullard, maybe um, you have some ideas because uh, uh, there are a lot of people that are crying at night because of all the pollution coming their way. I don't have a silver bullet. Uh, but the first four letters of my name is Bull. And there's a lot of that at 
TCEQ. They never met a permit they didn't like. And that's the problem. And I think we have to get more and more people aware, speaking out to say something must change. Uh, and again, uh, there's a level of pollution at which I think the region and the body can bear. And I don't know what the threshold is, but you're right. There are a lot of people who are saying uh, we, we need to move fast and furious to a clean energy transition, quicker, fast and furious. That's just my, re that's been my reaction. And uh, I'm a lifetime Sierra Club member. As a matter of fact, their Environmental Justice Award is named after me. <laughs> Thank you for your question. I'll give you a check later. With with deep apologies for the, the gentleman on the other side of the cameras there, um, we, we need to wrap up. We have one more question here, but I know some will stay after for other questions that, that need to be asked with some of our speakers. So, Hello, I'm Kristen Foster, and I am a graduate from Houston Tillotson College, and I wanted to say that voting is going to make the difference. We need to vote all the way up and down the ballot in every state, and we need to educate the public. Have more meetings like this would make a dramatic difference. And I wanted to thank um, Dr. Bullard for coming and sharing and inspiring the next generation of environmentalists. It's going to save lives in America, and we can do it. So I just thank you so much for what you've done and all of your work, and, and the future is bright. We are changing things, so thank God for you. Yes. You got off without a question. <laughs> Thank you all so much for being here, and thank you if we can give a round of applause to our panelists.